Hi, everyone. Welcome to Expo North Digital Shorts. I'm so excited today to have Valerie here, who is president and CEO of the Canada Media Fund. Hello, Valerie. Hello. How are you? Hello, everybody who's out there listening and watching and observing. Exactly. From our lockdown to yours, this is so nice yep. to be able to see you. You got it. Mine is a lock on the open prairie where I'm looking out my office window and watching the mares and their new baby foals, all that happened in the last month of May or so. Oh, that's why it must be a really lovely month to be there. Are flowers out and... I, well, it's kind of windy today, but I, I have to say I, I feel so privileged and so grateful to be in this particular spot in the world during this time. I have so many friends and family and staff and co-workers who are, you know, in the city and coping the best they can, but this is a whole different experience. So I feel every day I get up and walk to the pasture and I'm grateful for the privilege of being able to walk on this land. It's, it's good. That's just awesome. So you have a job that I think a lot of people are going to be envious over. It just seems so fun and pretty amazing. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, I'm the CEO at the Canada Media Fund, and we really are the largest agency in the country that finances television and digital media. And we got that mandate in 2009 from a very progressive cabinet minister who said, the world is soon going to watch content anytime, anyplace on the platform of their choice, and we better get with the program. So that's what we do. We have a, about a $350 million fund in both traditional TV and digital media. And the, the exciting, a lot of the exciting content that we're seeing and risk-taking and innovation is certainly coming out of the digital media field. So that's what we do at the CMF. That's just awesome. And before we go into a little bit about the current landscape and what's happening now, because it's a very interesting time to be commissioning things and making things, right. how, how did you get to do what you do? How did, how, what was well, the Well, it was a complete it was a complete accident. I've never applied for a job in my life. And I've been at this field now for getting close to for 35 years, I would say. And I've always worked in the arts and culture field. I actually trained in the theater. I was at the drama studio of Ealing in London many years ago after university. And then I, I you know, my family is... Um, German Polish origin and they are really good at cleaning up messes and every time an organization in my world view would collapse they'd call me up and I'd say oh yeah I could probably fix that You're so I'm fixer. good at, I'm a good fixer in terms of things that need to change or progress or be just generally cleaned up so every job I've had I've either fallen into or been headhunted for. I have very little formal administrative training and some, you know, the Banff, uh, Banff Arts Administration Program by way of example, but most of my life I've learned on the job through practical experience. And I'll tell you, you know, you never get to these kind of positions on your own. I have walked beside and behind a lot of tremendous people mm. who've taught me the most extraordinary things, both personally and professionally along the way. But this job I've had since 2006. So I've been here uh, getting a little long in the tooth, one might say, <laughs> for this kind of work. But every time I try to get out, there's another big transition or another big federal move that is interesting from a policy perspective. So I've stuck it out this long. And of course, we're in a big one right now. I was just going to say, I couldn't think of a better time for you to be where you are with the talents and skills you have. I love that you have a theater background, clearly like a, a true connection with the arts, and you have the ability to understand administrative stuff and fix things, yeah. which is a very rare combination of skills. So tell me what's happening right now. What is this? Well, look like? you know, like the rest of the world, we were heavily impacted in our sector by the virus. You know, 1500 projects down, people like in a state of shock, scrambling, uh, everything ground to a halt like it did everywhere. And so, of course, like many others, we had the staff working remotely, provided equipment, mm -hmm. provided support. I think it's really one of the really important things is to keep communication very close to the heart during this time. Mm -hmm. So we do set up biweekly calls with all staff. We have a small management group that meets every week just to kind of keep the machinery flowing, if you like, in spite of everything we're facing. A lot of people working from home are finding it very isolating and almost frightening.
frightening and sad and depressed and others are full of joy because they're not <laughs> dealing with the usual. So it's a mix and a gamut, but I think people generally are coping extremely well. Yeah. The other big thing we've been doing is, you know, we've been very fortunate. Our government has put a lot of money out of the door. Our first call with the minister, he, our minister, uh, Gibo in, in the heritage said that, you know, I think that was sort of mid-April and they had already put the um, value of two annual federal budgets out the door to support various sectors and industry, you know, not just ours, obviously. And you, when you think about it in that context, it's a lot of cash that, you know, they're trying, I think, very hard and, and doing a very good job at trying to support what needs to be supported so mm. that we can all recover from this. For us, it involved a lot of negotiation and discussion we're not the aerospace or manufacturing or agriculture industry. You know, we don't make widgets. It's a very eclectic and very diverse industry in terms of the type of contract, how the industry actually works. So we did a lot of negotiation through our department over the emergency relief funds, which I'm, I'm you know, really thrilled to say for both us and Telefilm Canada, there was about 127 million of which 88 came to the Canada Media Fund and we provided emergency relief within 10 days to our industry out there. Wow, so we turned it around on a dime. Yeah, our staff was just incredible on it. I can't say enough good things about it. I'm not just giving you a platitude. I was amazed because it's a big machine yeah. and 88 million is a lot of money. And, you know, luckily we had great people who were on the front lines who fixed all the problems and we opened within 10 days and overnight of the roughly thousand parent companies that were eligible, we had about 300 applications like overnight in 24 hours. Oh. So clearly, you know, the need is out there. But I think the other interesting thing that we've been looking at is, yes, this is a crisis, and yes, we're responding to it. We developed a kind of a three-phase document on, you know, dealing with the crisis and then stimulus to restart the industry, and then what might growth look like. And I think the interesting thing is it's not going to be the same as it was. If people who are trying to go back to where we were, it's never going to happen. I think we're going to have a very different industry. There'll be some collateral damage, of course. There can't help but be that in a time mm. like this. Mm. But my other observation is there's some really creative and interesting and innovative work going on out there. People are so, you know, for example, I, I, my heart was warmed when I heard this. We have a big medical series in Canada that donated all of their medical equipment to, you know, frontline workers and hospitals that needed that equipment at this time because they have no use for it at this particular moment. And that's just on a human empathy level. But I've seen experimentation in production. We know there's a lot of development going on. In fact, on our while all of this is going on, we're still managing our regular program. And our stats are looking like they're pretty comparable with previous years. It's a bit of a surprise. Nice. Yeah, we expected things to be way down, but in fact, they're almost level. Now, a lot of that's in development, which would make sense. And it's like, everybody's getting dressed up for the party and we're all getting on our, but we just don't know when the party's going to be. So like everywhere else, you know, the big question is when can production restart? Huge issues around that in terms of compliance with new health and safety measures. Mm -hmm. Nobody expected this. Where's the money going to come from? And of course, the big problem is the question of insurance. And a lot of yeah. companies now have have not allowed you know diseases like this to be covered so our production industry is working very hard on those things to look at what other countries are doing in terms of insurance and provisions for insurance but i think it's going to be interesting people are learning not just in our sector but in many to work differently to mm. work in different ways to work in some ways more collaboratively you know, we've been talking a lot to our visual effects people. They're very busy right now. But of course, the concern there is once they're finished, this kind of tranche of activity that had been produced before, they're going to have a big hole until production starts up again. So they're probably going to be affected more, you know, come August, September than right now. So it's a very, you know, nobody can second guess this or what's going to happen or where it's going to go. And I think... We have to bear in mind we're all human beings. We're doing the best we can. And what I've always said to the staff is just, you know, it, this is a time you're all working full on. They're all A-type personalities. They're all overachievers. So, you know, the flexibility is required. If okay. your dog's got to go to the vet or you got to pick up your kids or you're trying to deal with a partner that's around you every day, which is very new for many people. <laughs> 
you know, that's okay. You know, it's not a nine to five kind of environment. So yeah. we're getting the job done. I reported out to my board recently about what we'd accomplished in the eight week period. And I was shocked. So, you know, people are working very hard at the yeah. CMF and we're getting the job done and just, you know, cut yourself a little slack. It's okay. You yeah. know, if you're not working from nine in the morning till five in the afternoon, if you have to work in the evenings or you can't do something, that's fine. It's just yeah. where we're at and we'll all get through that's so heartening to hear. It's really heartening to hear that um, the industry is so responsive to the needs, yes. getting the money out, that there seems to be a path of development where that is traditional filmmaking. It's kind of still saying, I hope there's a Not party. Yeah. Yeah. And the Sorry. party will happen soon and we're just all paused. Yeah. And then there's another part of the industry that's saying we need a pivot whether it's yeah. turning a movie into an audio play first because all the actors are home to saying, you know, special effects is actually can build things out and maybe be able to work with the insurance companies in a way to make safer sets yeah. um, to, you know, you're quite right. There's room for innovation here. Yeah, um, I, think so. I think there is. I see that even in my own work, you know, it's different. Some of it's the same, but it's different. So I think it, I think in spite of the hit and the impact and I'm not, I'm not dismissing that in any way, shape, or form. But I think it, as human beings, we also have to have some empathy around that and things will change. You know, our broadcasters in the country, uh, oh, but maybe now about a month ago, did a big uh, program called Stronger Together. And it was right from Buffy to Bieber to Ryan Reynolds to everybody at French market, English market, 11 million views across all those platforms, which was outstanding wow. for the country. So I think that's just an indication that people have recognized where we are. We are all in this together. That's for sure. And keeping each other supported in this time is, is pretty, it's, it's what's critical really. And you know, we're all benefiting, I think from your, the incredible reach your media fund has. I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of people are watching from Versailles and costume dramas that happen elsewhere yep. to, um, I don't know if the media fund was involved with Schitt's Creek, but I know a lot of oh, people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're it watching. Was, I mean, I brilliant. Know, it's great. We're very proud of that. And, you know, we've had such great co-production partnerships around the world yeah. and co-ventures. We've certainly worked with Expo North, Ian and company. Everybody's been fantastic. And I think, you know, one of the things I recognized a few years ago is that in spite of our very large fund, we're a small country. And if we're going to really leverage that money, and this is a global business that people mm. are working in. One of the best things we can do is partner with great partners around the world. And we have, you know, in, in just the partnership program, about 12 or 15 15 direct partnerships, let alone all the co-production that goes on. And I think the world's always interested in good stories, no matter where they come from. Totally. And we've certainly seen that. Yeah. That's totally One right. of the things we also did, I should mention, because it's been so useful to everybody and anybody can access it. Our team in about a two week period built a, a COVID standalone microsite. And on that site is all the information, if you're Canadian, on all the programs that are available. There's a newsletter with it. Our trends department is doing podcasts on wow. various innovations in the sector. And all of that's available on the CMF website. So it's been a really important tool for people. And I think very much appreciated. And again, they turned that around in two weeks. They just gathered up information. so hard at work. Day. Yeah. They're really doing, they're really doing a good job. The other thing we did that was fun and really interesting was we have the Made New in French brand, which celebrates Canadian content and talent, no matter where they're working from in this day and age. And we had two very well-known, one in the French market, one in the English market, um, director, writer, actor type people do virtual tours of content from coast to coast to coast. So they would start in Newfoundland with a show that had been very well known there. It might be a show from the past, not necessarily a new one, and went across the country and talked about the show and then told people where they could screen it while the, while the crisis had hit and COVID started. So it was a lot of fun and it brought a lot of attention, I think, in, from both language markets to Canadian content that's been made and been very successful. That's so fun that you're still finding things to do now that are creating connections, creating yeah. a greater sense of community, um, yeah. showcasing talent. I think that's just awesome. So what does the future look like? I feel like I, I could ask anyone, but I feel in safe hands with the fixer here. So what, 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 what does the future just, look like? 
just before we leave the talent thing, though, I have to mention um, there's a there's a series on CBC called Kim's Convenience, which is known worldwide and was the number one show in Korea. And one of the actors there, Simu Liu, has just been hired to be in Marvel's new big um, what's it called? Shea Chai, I think. And so what we did through Made New, he's the ambassador for the month of May, and he's highlighting the success of all our Asian creators and talent and content that's happened out of Canada. Sandra Oh and everybody else that's involved yes. so that's been a really exciting again a real creative fun and interesting way to really expose our incredible talent to the world so what's the future look like well the future i think is the things of being scary and excited you mm -hmm. know we're we're looking at the cmf program it's our 10th anniversary this year i mean the fund itself has been around for about 30 years but since we got the mandate for both traditional tv and digital media that's been 10 years and while it's worked incredibly well and the success stories are many, you know, we're in a different time than 10 years ago. There's a few snags, I call them, that we'd like to see or like to get some relief from. Our industry is working in a global environment. Our Canadian industry is, is contracting a bit. You know, the impact of the foreign OTTs has been felt and there's good and bad to all of that. You know, a great opportunity to sell your content worldwide and be exposed to worldwide audiences, but you lose a lot of your rights mm -hmm. and it's put a lot of downward pressure on the Canadian broadcasting system for sure. You know, I'm, without getting too technical, we kind of have two tiers those who have to contribute to the making of the content and those who don't that are very active in the country. So I think that's going to shift. Mm -hmm. We did a big review of the Broadcasting Telecommunications Acts. And of course, now all of that's been on hold because mm -hmm. of the virus. But I think that'll get picked back up again. Mm -hmm. And for us at the CMF, I mean, in our growth strategy, we want to see a future where the CMF becomes a very strong content fund. I think I really believe that as long as we have tools in this country to make stellar content that the world is interested in the market will be interested and the market will pick it up so i think for us you know the future will be different i don't think there's any any choice about that but that doesn't mean it's negative i mean there there are again it's overcoming and trying to kind of hold the big waters at bay for the industry while we get through this and we will and yeah. we'll get through it and we'll come around again. And I think, you know, really good. My, my belief is always, I mean, it's a bit of a platitude, but everybody loves a good story. And if you're oh, in a way, in a position and you have support to do good storytelling, then it will survive. And I think be a kind of more interesting, better place. I do hope we aren't flooded with COVID stories. I was I mean, just going to say that. I was going to say, is there a certain type of story? You know, stories always speak to the zeitgeist, but we're all going to be so sick of COVID. I we're going to something... be so sick of it. And I mean, I've already seen online a whole bunch of things about, you know, stories from the underground, stories from the oh. And we will have that for sure. Yeah. People have to find how they're feeling about everything that's going on. But I hope it's, you know, we're not flooded with it. We can kind of get past that. I, in talking to, you know, CBC just did their upfronts the other day and other broadcasters in Canada are doing the same. And there's some pretty interesting stuff coming down the pipe. Great. The real key will be when production can get going again. Yeah. I mean, and that, yeah. as, as this goes on, and if there is the second wave that everybody's been discussing, you know, you, it's anybody's second guess. Some are saying, oh, we're, gonna, we're aiming to start up production in August. Some are saying there'll be none till the first quarter of 2021. And I think it'll vary all over the place. So yeah. every country and every type of, you know, agency like us, we'll just have to, we'll just have to see how it goes and, and be in step, I think, with what happens. We've tried our hardest to be very flexible. Yeah. We have certain restrictions based on how the program was developed and the Broadcasting Act in Canada, which we hope to get even increased relief from after this, yeah. because I think it's pointed out that flexibility is key, no matter, no matter if you're living through a crisis like this or at any time. But I think, you know, we're just going to have to go step by step and see how it goes. Well, what I think is really, really inspiring is that you guys are still such a team being really productive about being able to help still reach out, still take what's very important to you, make it happen while refining maybe some goals and learning from this. I think that's a very valuable use of this time. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of learning going on for everybody. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. Like, can I ask a little bit of advice before we leave? I hate to do this, but we're already over time. Can you leave us with a little bit of advice that you found helps you work better 
helps you in a situation or something you've learned along the way that's very valuable? Breathe. <laughs> you know, we're all human beings at the end of the day. We're all in this together. And what I have found the most valuable, even though I fight it, because I'm an A-type personality too, and you know, you have this guilt about, oh my God, I got to put in my eight, 10, 12 hours today. Just stop and breathe. I mean, as I said, I'm so fortunate. At six in the morning, I can walk out to the pasture. Many people in the world don't have that luxury. But even if you're in an apartment with a balcony, step outside, breathe, and just cut yourself some slack. Oh, it doesn't mean you have to be lazy or not do anything. But I think, for me, the most important thing this virus offers is reflection. It's a chance just to get off that wheel. You know, I was on a plane every four days, and my body had had it. And I didn't realize how bad it was until this hit. And I think we just have to stop and go inside a little bit yeah. instead of so much outside and see what's of real value to us as human beings, what's important, mm -hmm. and how we can support others in the world. Because if, if this isn't the time to do it, who knows? I'm into that. That's just wonderful. Valerie, thank you so much for joining thank us today. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry we're over time, but once you get me going, I can't stop. So I love it. We'll so have to do a part two. <laughs> And hello to everybody at Expo North. Love you guys very much. I can hardly wait to get back to Scotland. We, we can't wait for that. That sounds All great. Right.